Sisters and brothers, grace to you in peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Who can help me finish the wine? What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. Okay, bonus point for anyone who remembers who says this line. It's not Romeo, it's Juliet. It's Juliet. Juliet is, the, the name that she's talking about is the name of her beloved Romeo, Romeo Montague, who by virtue of his name, Montague, his family name, is by definition an enemy of her family, the Capulet family. And she is saying that if Romeo were known by any other name, he would still be exactly who he is. He would still be just as lovely and beautiful to me as he is. And the name itself is really meaningless. Okay, second question. Who can finish the line? Different story. Tonight, tonight, my plans I make. Tomorrow, tomorrow, the baby I take. The queen will never win the game for blank is my name. Rumpelstiltskin. Who remembers Rumpelstiltskin? Okay, all right. Rumpelstiltskin. I had a little Fisher-Price turntable, you know, one of those with, a, with some of the stories that were read out loud with little beeps for you to turn the page, and I had one of Rumpelstiltskin. I listened to that thing, and it scared the living daylights out of me because what happens, Rumpelstiltskin makes a deal with a peasant girl who wants to become the queen. She promises to, uh, he, he, she needs to spin uh, the, the straw into gold, and he does it for her, um, but at the cost of her child, which, she will, which he will take from her, and uh, unless, unless she can guess his name, and she, she figures out, she, she spies on him, and, and finds out his name, and, and when his name is revealed, the earth opens and swallows him up. It's made a profound impression on me as a child. <laughs> and, and in our culture, when we talk about fairy tale endings, we are usually not talking about characters getting swallowed up by the earth, although maybe we should, because that's kind of the Brothers Grimm for you, uh, the Brothers Grimm fairy tale. Two very different images of what a name is in these two stories. For Juliet, and I suspect for her author, William Shakespeare, a name is just a mask over the reality. A name is an arbitrary label. It can be replaced or modified, shifted, without affecting the reality underneath. The mask can change, but under that, the true essence of the thing is unchanging. A rose would still be beautiful to us. It would still smell as beautiful to us as it does. Even if a rose were called a violet, or if it were called George, or if it were called Flibbertigibet. The name doesn't matter. The thing, the thing is is the true essence, the name is just a label. On the other hand, in the world of the, the, the Rumpelstiltskin story, in the world of the grim fairy tales, a name is something that connects to the essential identity, to the character, to the power of the person who holds it. A name is not just a meaningless label but it is, in fact, part of the secret of the person's very life. And to know their name, to know their name is to know them, and in a way, to have power over them. So the name contains within it the power of the person who bears that name. Our world and our culture mostly, I would say, shares the opinion of Juliet. Name is just an arbitrary set of signifiers that can be altered, adopted, embraced, changed at will without affecting the thing underneath. It's just words, just letters. 
The world of the scriptures is much more like the world of the grim fairy tales. In the world of the scriptures, a name is a powerful thing. It is not a simply arbitrary label with no relationship to the thing underneath. But it is a site and a source of real power. And this lives on in the church, in that when I baptize Henry in a few minutes here, I do not take him or any other child in my arms and say, I baptize you, whoever you are, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Or I baptize anybody at all in that name. But I take the child in hand and say, Henry, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And today, it is fitting that we think about this because today is set aside by the church as the festival of the holy name of Jesus, the circumcision and name of Jesus. Eighth day uh, of his life, Jesus is, in accordance with the law, uh, taken to, uh, to, be, uh, to be circumcised and to be ritually given his name, Jesus. The name that, uh, that well, probably Yeshua in, in his own language and on its long journey through Greek and Latin and, and, and German, uh, arrives in English as Jesus. But this is the name that, he had, that has been set aside for him, that he is given in his ritual inclusion in the people of Israel. And the importance of the name and the power of the name goes back all the way to the beginning through the scriptures. It's all the way there through the Old Testament, most particularly with a, with a unique kind of, of force in the story of the exodus from Egypt and the wandering in the wilderness. Moses, you may remember, Moses goes out into the desert and he, and he encounters the burning bush and out of the burning bush a voice speaks to him and says, you're going to go to Egypt and you're going to set my people free, you're, gonna, you're going to bring them out of captivity. And Moses says, who will I say has sent me? Because I can't just say some voice. And the burning bush tells him, tell them, I am what I am. Or I will be what I will be. Has sent me. And this name, which four letters in Hebrew, mysterious name, which we usually flesh out as Yahweh, is so important that there is a commandment given to Moses sometime later that, that addresses it. You remember this from your Sunday school and your catechism, hopefully. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It was so important, it was so charged with power that you could not simply throw the name of this God around. And this prohibition developed to such a point that you could not even write God's proper name on paper. You couldn't say it outside of certain circumstances, you couldn't even write the name of God. And so you will notice in your Bibles the tradition developed of substituting the proper name of God, Yahweh, I am what I am, with a generic word, Adonai, which means Lord. And in your Bibles, most of your Bibles to this day, and in your bulletin, where it says Lord in capital letters, that is a replacement for the proper name of God. So if you look at the reading from Numbers today and hear it with God's proper name, it sounds a little different. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, speak to Aaron and his sons, these are the people who are going to be the priests of Israel, thus shall you, the priests, bless the Israelites. You shall say to them, Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they, the priests, shall put my name on the Israelites, and I will bless them. So the proper name of God will be invoked, will be placed upon God's people in this action. That is the power of God's name. And when we look at this in the, in the story of Jesus, we do not see that same prohibition. Among Christians, nothing ever developed where, where we, we couldn't write the name of Jesus or speak the name of Jesus uh, and had to work around it. Nevertheless, the name of Jesus he saves is in itself a very important and very powerful word in our faith. And it ought to be a very important and a very powerful word in our lives. It is perhaps, if not the shortest, at least the simplest and most direct prayer that we can ever make. Simply the name of Jesus. And when you have no other way to pray, when you are alone, or fearful, or in any kind of trouble, and you do not know what to say, and you do not know what to ask for, we can always begin and end our prayer with the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus invokes everything that he is and everything that he does, from his birth among us to his life and teaching and healing to his innocent death and his resurrection from the dead and his ascension to glory. All of this is included in his name. All of these things done for us and called back down upon us when we say the name Jesus. And on some level, we all know this because of how effective the name of Jesus is as an utterance when we are angry or frustrated or disgusted. I am 43 years old. I have been a Lutheran pastor for, whatever, 13 years now. I am still, over the course of my life, in deficit in invoking the name of Jesus to bless, to aid, to comfort, as opposed to invoking the name of Jesus to curse or to lament or to express anger. We know the power of this name, or we would not use it even in this disrespectful way. And our Friends, uh, uh, siblings in the Orthodox tradition have a very powerful devotion about the name of Jesus. And this is a devotion that can take the place of daily prayers. If you can't do them, it is in itself considered sort of sufficient for, for your, your whole prayer life to repeat this, this prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. This can be repeated hundreds, thousands of times a day, in your own mind, out loud. And while I cannot claim to be any sort of expert on doing this or, or what it is supposed to evoke, I have drawn strength over the course of, of many years now from being able, in any circumstance, to simply say, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me. Because Jesus wills and Jesus grants that we may weave his name into our lives, even as he has woven us into his body, and even as he has woven himself into all of human nature through his birth among us. And he leaves us this simple, humble, ordinary exhortation, invocation, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Or, if you can't get that far, simply Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Whenever we are in need of comfort, strength, courage, hope, so that we would know 
the comfort, courage, strength, hope, and every other blessing is just a name away.